Hey everyone, we are going to be talking today about the topic of teshuva and forgiveness, in particular the forgiveness of others. We're going to be talking about teshuva and forgiveness as it relates to God, but then parallel it and focus on how our teshuva with others uh, is also related to our forgiveness from God. We're going to be talking about what forgiveness actually is. We're going to be talking about why it's important. And we're also going to give some tips as to how to make it a little bit easier uh, in a person's life to, to, make for, to, to, to have forgiveness towards another person. Okay? So if you are excited about that, if you like that, give us a thumbs up, give us a like, give us a share, and help spread the message to those around you as well. We had some technical difficulties last night. The, the lesson cut out early, so I wanted to at least give a recap at some of the things that we discussed. Now, one of the things that it talks about in the Jewish tradition, when a person does teshuva, uh, in particular when a person does teshuva in making amends with God, it, aside from the confession that a person has to confess the sin that they did, and aside from the remorse that a person has to feel uh, about what they did, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, says as follows. He says that the one who knows the secrets of the heart, meaning God, the one who knows the secrets of the heart will be able to testify about that person that they're no longer going to commit that sin ever again. Now, there's two questions on that Rambam. Number one, how can that be? How can God testify on a person that they'll never do that sin again? Because as we know, one of the foundations of our faith is that a person always has free will. And if a person always has free will, then they always have the opportunity. They can possibly always do it again. So how does that work? And secondly, why does the Rambam refer to God as the one who knows the secrets of the heart in this instant? And the answer to both of those questions can be found with an anecdote from a, a gentleman uh, who was in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And this gentleman in AA, one of the incentives, if a person is in uh, some of the recovery programs uh, that, that take place on a yearly basis, is you pick up your chick. And so after a year of being completely drug-free, uh, or whatever, whatever your uh, addiction of choice was, you pick up a chick and say, you know, this is, this is, this is my, this is, that's your symbol of accomplishment uh, for maintaining uh, being clean. And so after, after every year you pick it up and it's, and it's a great incentive to, you know, I picked up my chip and every year it's a great, it's a great, wonderful accomplishment. Now, this gentleman was picking up his 25 year chip. It means he had been 25 years clean of, from, from drinking alcohol. It had not ruined his life. He had fought it and he had worked with it and he had gone to recovery and he was picking up his, his chip of 25 years. And he said something very, very profound when he picked up his chip. He says, the man that I once was drank and the man that I once was would drink again. And the implication is that the person who's standing in front of you now is a completely different individual. In other words, I might have the same body and I may even have the same soul, but me as an individual, the person that I am, completely perfected and refined my personality to the extent that I am not that person who did that, who participated in those types of things anymore. And this is what, this is what it means to do teshuva. This is what it means, aside from the confession and aside from the remorse, you're basically a different entity. You're basically a different human than you were uh, back when you were doing those types of things. And so when it comes to teshuva, especially when, with regard to, uh, to uh, us, between us and God, a person's mission in this world, is, you know, the soul was basking up in the heavenly realms, basking with God, basking with truth, basking with spirituality, cleaving to God in the utmost sense, and is sent down into this world for a mission. The mission is to look past all of the falsehood of this physical world, all of the uh, proclivities and temptations that this world has to offer, and see the godly core behind it, and 
work towards the godly path and bring out spirituality within the darkness of this physical world, and thereby achieving a higher sense of connectivity with God uh, in the long run, right? When you subject yourself to challenges and you're able to overcome those challenges, that is the ultimate connection with God, not just basking in the glow of God. And so the soul comes down here after uh, it's, it was cleaving to God. And the soul comes down and get down into this world. And sometimes it could be that we disobey God. We disobey what God wants from us. We disobey what the Torah tells us is what God wants from us. And we, you know, we mess up. This makes a clog in our connection with God. That, that doesn't sever, doesn't destroy our connection, but it certainly does clog the pathway uh, between our, ourselves and God. And what tshuva, the idea of returning, the idea of repenting, the, what, what that sort of redemption, personal redemption can mean, is meant to do, is that a person can once again cleave to God uh, in the way that they uh, originally uh, were supposed to do, in the, in the way that they originally were. Now, in, in the pathway towards forgiveness, there, there are three words that tend to be used regarding forgiveness. And they're used with regard to forgiveness that God bestows upon us. And then we're going to see that they have parallel in the, the forgiveness that we can give to others as well. So the first type of forgiveness, the first stage uh, of forgiveness, uh, is mechila. Mechila it literally means forgiveness. And that means it's typically used when a person is forgiven of a debt. And so, for example, you can be moichel somebody, a debt that they owe you. They owe you $10, and you can say, yeah, don't worry about it, I'm, I'm moichel you, I forgive, I forgive the debt. You no longer owe me $10 anymore. And so that's, that's one stage. Um, and so the, the, when we're talking about that with regards to our connection with God, when God has mechila towards us, when God forgives us, He's forgiving us of a debt. Now, what's the debt that we might owe God? Well, our soul's mission down in this world can kind of be seen like a CEO sending out someone on a business trip. When a CEO sends out a worker on a business trip, he sends one of his executives out, uh, and he gives them all sorts of money and resources in order to accomplish whatever the company needs and wants accomplished. So he might have his rental car, he might have his hotel, might have $10,000 in order to meet the client and entertain them and whatever it is. There is a certain amount of resources allocated to the person who's going on this business trip. Now let's say when the executives, when he, when he goes out, he's doing his business trip, He's got the company credit card at his disposal, and he starts seeing other things that he likes, not that not are that aren't part of the mission, that were were never a part of the plan, that weren't what this business, that weren't what the the, the credit card was was meant for. He see goes into an antique shop, he sees a painting that he really liked. It's ten thousand. It, it, it's it's uh, it's five hundred dollars, and he swipes the company credit card um, for this for this thing that he saw, this this painting that he saw. Well, when when the CEO is going to go through the list of, you know, the, th the things, the expenses that were acc accrued on this trip, he's going to see, wait, 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 what's this, what's this painting? Okay, great. The, the, the rental car, that makes sense. The hotel, that makes sense. You know, uh, money, the dinners, and whatever, that all makes sense. What is this painting for $500? That wasn't a part of the mission. You, you owe me $500, right? You, he's not, not going to pay for that, allow that on the company credit card. And it works in the same way. It, but it works in the same way with God. God gives us a certain amount of abilities and resources in order to use in this world to accomplish the mission that he sent us here for, right? To adhere to the Torah, to uplift the world through using the lens of the Torah. Now, if we decide while we're here on our business trip that we're going to start using things for our own purposes, that we're going to do not what the Torah says, but we're going to eat what I want to do and do what I want to do, then all of a sudden we've accrued a debt, right? That's not what I sent you here for. The CEO tells us that's not what I sent you here for. So the first stage in forgiveness is mechila, right? That God says, you know what? I forgive you of the debt. And again, this comes with remorse, repentance, uh, confession of, of what we've done. But that's the, the first stage in God's forgiveness. The first aspect of God's forgiveness is mechila, is that God pardons, uh, God, God forgives the debt of, in which we have um, accrued. The second 
uh, the second aspect of forgiveness when it comes to our relationship with God is called salicha. The salicha uh, means that when a person does something that they're not supposed to do towards God, it creates this clogging, it creates this barrier in our connection with God. And so what salicha does, when, when the idea of salicha means that God um, removes the obstacles that have been set up between us and him. So again, Mechila, God forgives the debt. There's no debt owed. Uh, the uh, slicha is the idea that God uh, says there's no more obstacles between us. And the last step is kapara. Kapara means atonement, meaning the sin itself is erased. The sin itself is no longer there. The difference between forgiveness and atonement, you can think about it in the sense of, imagine you're you're walking with a glass of wine into your friend's house, and your friend has a new beige carpet. And while you're carrying the wine, you sneeze, and wine goes everywhere, all over, and stains their nice new beige carpet. And so your friend, if they're nice, and they, and they, they say, hey, look, I, I don't hold it against you. I forgive you for what you did. So they, they may forgive you, and they may not hold it against you. But at the end of the day, there is a big stain on the carpet. And so kapara, atonement, means that you go out to one of the cleaning companies, the carpet cleaning companies, and you get that thing cleaned up, that there's no more stains available. So the forgiveness can be there even when the stain is still there. Atonement means the stain is no longer there, but forgiveness can be granted even if the stain is there. The person can say, I don't hold it against you. So these aspects of divine forgiveness have counterparts in human forgiveness. And so the person who harmed us, number one, needs to apologize, needs to make amends for the, for the offense that they did. And the offended person can be moichel them, can forgive them, uh, pardon their debts, right? Get rid of their debts. Uh, the second thing, slicha, the offense, the, the barrier that the offense created uh, slicha can eliminate the barrier between two people if a, per, if a person wants to do that, right? It's encouraged to do that. Um, and finally, we can divest ourselves of any hostile feelings that we have towards the person and, uh, and grant kapara, that it's, it, it's a non-thing anymore. Now, sincere teshuva, real repentance towards Hashem, can transform sins into merits. It says that if a person really does sincere, real teshuva, really um, repents and returns to God, the, the sins that they did can actually be transformed into merits because the, those sins were the act, actually were the galvanizing force in making them to become a better and closer individual to God. It's kind of like somehow, sometimes it's described in the recovery community that when a person, uh, sometimes if, until a person hits rock bottom, they don't start making improvements. And so then that rock bottom that they hit, again, it's, not, it's, nothing, that they, it's nothing that we would have preferred to happen, but that rock bottom was the beginning stage of you making yourself a better person. That's, that's a very worthwhile thing. And when it comes to God, if the, if the, if the sin that a person committed, if the offense that a person did, is something that eventually galvanizes the person to make a deeper connection with God. And make, they are remorseful of it. They want to make themselves a better person uh, because of it. What happens is that the person, uh, that the, those sins are transformed into merits. They become something that's meritorious. And one of the ways that this is described, one of the parables that, uh, that this is, uh, how this is laid out in Jewish tradition, uh, when you when when we talk about either our connection with God or our connection with other people, we can talk about it in the sense of like that there is a cord, there's a rope. So imagine that the, uh, the connection between myself and God is we're attached by a rope. And so when a person does something that they shouldn't do, it makes a a cut in the rope. However, when a person repents and 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 properly um, atones for what they what they have done wrong. The, that rope is tied back together. And when you tie a rope back together, the, the outcome of that is that the, the two ends of the rope are now closer together because they're tied in the middle. And so it can be 
that the person who has done something wrong, who has offended, but then comes back and tries to make it right, they can actually make a greater connection with God and a greater connection with other people as well. And so that's why Jewish tradition teaches in the Talmud that in the place where the penitent stands, even the completely righteous can't stand because the penitent has done, has, has experienced, has tasted the fallacy of the world, has tasted the wrong things, and realize that that is not the life that they want to live and now is, 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 is coming close to God. That's even better than someone who's never tasted it before. And so in human relationships, the idea of teshuva can be the, is the step that enables the return of friendship and love between two people. Okay, so why is forgiveness important? Why is forgiveness important? The, the primary reason why forgiveness is important in general is it, we, the world would be a terrible place if every misdeed that we ever did was held against us. There has to be a certain amount of forgiveness uh, available and allotted to us that, or else we wouldn't be able to live. Right? Forgiveness makes it possible for us to live both between our connection with God and our connection with other people. The Torah has a prohibition. The Torah's prohibition says, do not carry hatred towards your brother in your heart, which means don't carry a grudge against any human being uh, for something that they've done wrong to you. Now, that's hard, but the Torah is commanding us to do that. The Torah tells us this is how you must live. Don't carry a grudge. Don't bear hatred in your heart towards your friend. Right? And so the same Torah that tells us not to eat pork also tells us not to have hatred towards another person. It's harder to do sometimes, right? Some mitzvahs are harder than others. Some mitzvahs are easy, right? There's a, there's a commandment in the Torah not to eat worms. Not too many people struggle with that one. But the same Torah that tells you not to do that also tells you don't bear hatred in your heart against another person. And so it's conceptually, it's not possible to be a quote-unquote religious person a Torah-observant person if you have hatred in your heart towards another person. Now, again, sometimes, it's easy, sometimes that's harder to do than others. But the, at the end of the day, that has to be our worldview. That has to be our mindset not to hold any hatred towards another person. Now, I, I've heard some people say that that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. They don't deserve to be forgiven by me. So... You know, regarding that type of thing, the Baal Shem Tov had an interesting teaching. The Baal Shem Tov taught, based on a verse in the Tehillim, based on a verse in the Psalms, that says, Hashem Tzilcha, right? God is your shadow. And the Baal Shem Tov explained that verse, God is your shadow, to mean that in the same way that your shadow mimics whatever you do, God also mimics whatever you do. In other words, your behavior towards others, God mimics and, and, and acts in his behavior towards you. So if you are quick to forgiving others, God will be quick to forgiving you. If you're merciful towards others, God will be merciful to you. And when we ask God to be merciful to us and forgive us, even if we're not deserving, if we're quick to forgive others, God will also be quick to forgive us. Again, it may not be easy to forgive. It may not be an easy thing. But who says, Avayd Hashem? Who says serving God it is an easy thing? Now, what is forgiveness? Because a lot of people have a misconception as to what forgiveness actually is. Forgiveness is not condoning something. It doesn't mean that you're saying that the action was right, right? A wrongful act is a wrongful act. You're not saying the action was right. When God forgives, it's possible that the act be erased completely. In human forgiveness, there can still be forgiveness even if a person remembers the act. Forgiveness is not about condoning. It's not you're saying, well, it was really right. No. Forgiveness is not justifying. It's not you saying, well, uh, there's a reason for it, and, uh, you know, I'm going to try to... It, 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 it's not, you know, I don't have to justify the person. The wrongful act is a wrongful act. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation necessarily. Forgiveness is one side. Forgiveness is about you, your feeling inside. 
A person can forgive somebody who never wants to be forgiven. Let's say you had a dispute with somebody or someone was terrible to you, did something terrible. You can forgive that person even if they will never seek out your forgiveness. They were a real low life and they'll never apologize to you. You can still forgive them. You know, reconciliation is when both parties kind of come together, right? Uh, the, the offender says, I'm very sorry uh, for what I've done. They, they, they make amends and the, the, the other, one on the other side can forgive them for what they've done. And the two, they reconcile, they can, they can come to a newfound love and connection. Uh, but forgiveness is about what's going on inside of you. Forgiveness means you're not harboring anger or hatred towards another person. Forgiveness means that you're not letting another person occupy right, rent-free, valuable space up here and in here. That you're not going to let them continue to control and, and destroy your life because you have such a burning hatred towards them. So that's the importance of forgiveness. That's why we forgive. That's, uh, now let's, let's, let's take a step back a second. And let's talk about the, you know, something that might make it a little easier to forgive. Because sometimes we end up messing ourselves over when it comes to forgiveness. So there, there's an idea, and it's talked about in, in this, this week, every, every week in the summer months on, on Shabbat during the, during the late afternoon, after Mincha, we read Perkei uh, Avot, right? The Ethics of Our Fathers. A volume from the Mishnah that talks about the wisdom that it's different, the wisdom of different rabbis and sages um, in Talmudic times, in Mishnahic times, and and so what um, what in this week's in this week's uh, portion, this week's chapters, uh, one of the things that it tells us to do is to judge others favorably, right? You have, it should be dan lekavshus, judge others favorably. Now, what exactly does that mean? What exactly does that mean? The Rambam says, explains it very, very clearly what Don Lakavskos means and says that, it, that it's different depending on whether you don't know the person or whether you do know the person. So if you don't know the person and you see somebody doing something that could either be interpreted in a positive way as something good or in a negative way as something bad, Don Lakavskos means, right, judging them favorably means that you assume that they're doing the right thing. You assume that they are trying the right path. But if you know the person and you know them well, and you know and they have and they are you know them to be a righteous person, and they have a reputation of being a righteous person, and you see them doing something that is seemingly not good, right? But there is at least a sliver of a way that that could possibly be construed as good. The Rambam says you have to assume that what they're doing that that they what they're doing was good. And if you take it a step further, let's say you know somebody to be a righteous person, a good person, and they have a reputation of being a righteous person, and they actually do something that's objectively wrong, that's objectively bad. Don Lakovskos would say something like, we have to assume that that is an anomaly, that this is, it's a fluke. It's like, so like they, they must have done it. There must have been some sort of like temporary insanity that went on and just this is not who the person is. What happens a lot of the time is when somebody does something, knowingly or unknowingly, whether it's against us or not against us, we make it to be against us. And not only that, but we assume malicious intent. So when someone from the office does something to us, uh, a coworker, uh, even sometimes when our children do something, or our parents do something, or our community, whoever it is, does something that wasn't meant to be directed at you at all, but they do something that's offensive. We not we read it as something that was done with malicious intent. That person premeditated it. They meant to do something bad to me. There's a, there's a great philosophical principle called Hanlon's Razor. And Hanlon's Razor really enables us to uh, sort of look at things in a different way. It's a great, great mental model that we, can, that we can use that will greatly affect our lives. The, the model is, 
the, the Hamlin's razor is that never assume malice to things that can equally be attributed to human stupidity or error. All right, so applying Hamlin's razor to our daily lives allows us to develop better relationships, become less judgmental of other people, and also improves our rationality. Because when we're angry at somebody, right, we start, we start our mind can go to all sorts of crazy places. Hanlon's razor allows us to give people the benefit of the doubt and have more empathy towards people as well. I mean, we all live very complex lives where things are constantly going wrong, right? Murphy's laws, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. So common sense, or excuse me, not common sense, common, the common response that people have is to blame others and to assume malicious intent when something goes wrong. Right? People are quick to accuse corporations or politicians, their bosses, employees, right? even their family members of trying to derail them. It's something we used to, oh, they malicious, oh, they premeditated this whole thing. And to assume intent in this situation is likely going to worsen the problem. Right? None of us can ever know what someone else really wanted to happen. The, the smartest people in the world can do very stupid things. The most righteous people in the world can make grave errors, can fall, can fail, can make big mistakes. But Hanlon's razor tells us to, have, to try to grant people the benefit of the doubt, at least, you know, to, to that don't assume malice. Because here's what happens. When a person's angry at somebody, when we assume malice at somebody, the, what happens is other parts of our brain start kicking in. And then we start having what we call hindsight bias. Hindsight bias means we start looking at the past. Well, if they're doing this now, I start looking at the past and say, I always knew that guy was a low life. I always knew that guy was a scoundrel. How could I have been so blind? How could I have been so stupid? And we start reading back into, the, into past things and say, oh, I always knew it. And then confirmation bias kicks in. And what confirmation bias does is it starts cherry picking different instances from those past events and, and finds examples that validate our new found discovery of who this person really is. Right? We, find, we start finding examples. Exa oh, th and, and this, and I'm looking back, oh my gosh, it's so clear to me now. There was that time, and there was that time. That should have been strike one, and that was strike two, and that should have been strike three. And we build up this whole picture about who this person is now. And when, and when hindsight bias and confirmation bias kick in, it's... Uh, it can create almost like a conspiracy theory. This is how conspiracy theories work, by the way. So the, the Dubner Magid, a great sage uh, in the past few hundred years, uh, gave an example. He says that he gave an example of a, of a person walking through the forest. And when the person was walking through the forest, he saw a tree that had an arrow directly through a target. And he was really impressed. And he walked a few feet further and he saw again a tree that had a target on it and the arrow directly through the bullseye. And continued walking further, sees another target on a tree, another arrow directly through the bullseye. And he keeps seeing this and he comes to a clearing in the forest and he sees the archer winding up his bow. And he runs over to the archer and he says, wow, you're the most amazing archer I've ever seen in my life. How do you, how do you nail the target with such accuracy every time? Bullseye every time. He says, it's very simple. First, I shoot the arrow, and then whenever it lands on the tree, I just draw a target around it. And this is kind of the way that it works with conspiracy theories, right? How do conspiracy, not even conspiracy theories. This is how if a person wants to prove anything, right? In hindsight, very easy to prove something in hindsight, right? So, for example, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of missionaries will come to Jewish people, and they'll tell us that, Jesus was foretold in the Tanakh. Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament. And here's our proof, right? They'll take a bunch of things that Jesus did in the New Testament. They'll go back to the, what would they call the Old Testament, and find verses that are not talking about the Messiah, that aren't talking about anything. They're talking about nebulous, not, not, has nothing to do with nothing. But 
they'll say, oh, this, and that's pointing exactly to what Jesus fulfilled in the new. So you shot the arrow of what you need, of what Jesus did, and then you try to draw the target around it. See, all of these things in the Old Testament were foretelling exactly what happened in the new. And if you don't know any better, you look at it and you say, wow, it was so clear. How can I be so blind? It works the same way. Whenever we want to, whenever we want to do something, uh, we, find, uh, we find the same thing with prophecies of Nostradamus, where in hindsight, we look back and we find these vague, the prophecies of Nostradamus are written in ancient French. And they'll, the, what they'll do is they'll take some, an event that happens nowadays and they'll go back and they'll give a, a loose translation of this ancient French and the metaphoric terminology you can read into the, the words exactly what you want to find in the here and now. Right? The two eagles will crash into the pillars, and then the great eagle will, will ascend and go to war with the nation of the east. And right? it's like, oh my gosh, after 9-11, that makes so much sense. The eagles that crashed into the pillars, that's, that's talking about the, the, the planes that went into the Twin Towers. It's so clear. And then, then the eagle, right? America will go to war with the nation of the west, that, the, the nation of the east, that's talking about Afghanistan. And that, oh my gosh, it's so clear. And meanwhile, it's entirely attributed to hindsight bias and confirmation bias. And it works the same way with conspiracy theories as well. You take a, an idea that you think is a fact or that you know to be a fact, uh, and, then you, or, 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 and then you start drawing all sorts of uh, targets, right? Or you just start drawing all sorts of bullseyes around all these targets and find examples, exact examples of how that Per, of how that of how that situation uh, is all tied together. It's all part of one big giant conspiracy. You just, they, they used to say in Soviet Russia that show me the man and I'll show you his crime. Meaning that if we want to shoot the arrow at some at something or at somebody, we can we can draw we can make a whole picture of how it's so clear that that this is all that all of these things are interconnected. And it comes back the same thing with a person, when we're angry at somebody, and we've, we've decided on who this person is, we can draw up in retrospect, right? When, the, when it was happening, we never would have suspected anything. But now, in hindsight, oh my gosh, this person's terrible, they're a low life, they're, they're the worst, right? And we make for ourselves this whole backstory a whole conspiracy that everything that they did and everything that they wanted, there was all this giant thing out to get me. Hanlon's Razor says, don't assume malice where human stupidity can, can be assumed. Because our mind, when we assume malice, and we get angry at somebody, and we have hatred towards somebody, our mind can take us to crazy places. And then instead of forgiving the person, let's say the offense that they actually did was this big, but with all of your hindsight and confirmation bias, and you've built it into something that's this big, well, it's much harder to forgive something that's this big than something that's this big. And so we have to take that into account. We have to try to use our, our reason and not not get caught up in our emotions, not get caught up in our anger, our hatred, or whatever the case may be, and try to look at the person as, as someone who didn't mean anything by it. Again, I'm not trying to whitewash uh, every situation, but in, in oftentimes we can make something, uh, even, some, even something that is big inherently, we can make it even bigger than it actually is or than it actually needs to be. And so as we, as we now enter into the time where we're approaching Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, a time of amends, a time of judgment, a time of atonement, we should, we should think about the lessons that we have learned today, that our relationship with other people determines our relationship with God. If a person wants to be granted forgiveness, a uh, person should, gr should grant forgiveness to others. If a person wants to be get granted mercy on high, even if they're not deserving, they should grant mercy to others. 
uh, even if they are undeserving. And we should utilize the, uh, these opportunities to make them the times that are full of forgiveness, full of impossible reconciliation, and come into the high holidays and begin a new year fresh and without any sort of hatred in our hearts. Have a wonderful day, and uh, God willing, we'll teach and, and see all of you soon. Take care.